Well, hey, hey, guys, welcome to the studio today, mastering. After about 35 years of experience as a recording and mixing engineer, I tried my hand at mastering. I watched a couple dozen videos. My earliest masters that I came up with were not good. I think it's time to go back and look at the basics. How can we get good results? Let's get to it. The earliest goals of mastering had to do with how loud a track was carved into a vinyl record. If you carved it too deep, you'd actually tear a hole right through the vinyl. That was no good. Do it too quiet and you were missing out on some of the dynamic range of the medium, from loud to soft. So they required mastering engineers. They would set the level nice and loud, but not too loud, and that's going to be our first goal. Our second goal is going to be making sure it sounds good when it arrives at that volume. Now, getting a good master completely depends on whether you have done the mix properly to begin with. Now, with that in mind, we're only going to employ two different plugins to do this, an EQ and a compressor. Some people will say, let's run a limiter. Not a bad idea. But really, a limiter is just a compressor with the ratio cranked way up. If I wanted limiting, we can do that on our compressor just by cranking the ratio way up. So, EQ and a compressor. Let's get to it. I've got a mix loaded up here in Ableton. We're going to take a quick listen to it. It's pretty dynamic. Hold up. It's pretty groovy. Now, in preparation, I just want to show you a couple things. Here is my master track over here. And what you just heard peaked around negative 10 dB. And as we look down the other tracks that were in play here, you're going to see nothing went really any louder than that. And that's a good thing as we go into the mastering process. The first thing that I do is I concern myself with any overwhelming low frequencies in the very, very, very low end. I'm talking from 20 hertz, 30 hertz, down in that area. So I have my EQ up here. This is EQ8 in Ableton, and I can drag this around. And it's a pretty steep cliff, and it will drop off any lows below a certain point. I'm going to abuse it just to show you what it does. So here's the actual track. Sweeping it right, you can hear all the bass go away. Obviously that's no good. some of that bass back in. I will drop down the stuff down there around 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 hertz quite dramatically as a matter of course, except if it's very uh, deficient in bass to begin with. But everything I work with looks like a graphic equalizer. When most people listen to a mix that you put out, there's near a 0% chance they're going to hear anything below 30 hertz or below 40 hertz in their car, on their home stereo, on their headphones or earbuds, or especially not on their phone. All that information in your mix is actually robbing your mix of power. We don't need it. We're going to cut it out, but we're going to listen closely to make sure that we're not hurting the sound of the mix. Here I'm going to dial out those low lows. I can see some information down here.
that's 30 hertz there. But I can hear it. Okay, that's, that's 27 hertz and I'm comfortable there. We'll do that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be looking for any bad mids. Now, if my mix was done properly, I really shouldn't have any. But if they're in there, we're going to find them. So I'm going to grab a band up around 1K, and I'm just going to sweep it from left to right, and I'm going to listen what happens when I boost it. If I find something really, really bad, I'm on to something. High treble. Ooh, there might be some mud here. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I'm hearing some mud around 180. I don't like it. Now I know, probably what I can do is just give it a little bit of a pull down here. And don't forget, we can narrow our frequencies a little bit by using our quality control on that channel, which will kind of narrow this up or widen it. And I'm going to do this a little bit by ear. So we know it's bad. So not so much. The last thing that I'm going to do now that I've managed the lows, I've managed the mids, I'm going to take a look at the treble. This is the high stuff where the cymbals and all the air reside. There's a lot of air up there. I do that to help me hear what I'm actually changing. And to my ear, that sounds pretty good. Now, for the little bit of magic. Now, you can see this chart behind me. I know it seemed like a pretty drastic cut out of the low frequencies. That's okay. The other two changes I made in the mid-range and in the treble, none of them were more than 3 dB. But the bit of magic is this. However much you think you hear something is working correctly, back it off a little bit. So I heard this area here at about 3 dB, figure that's like 6 dB, here's 3 dB, and I'm just going to back it off to about 2. Did the same thing in the high frequencies. All the way up here would have been about 6 dB. I was running about 3 dB, and I'm going to back that down off closer to 2 dB, and I'm going to give it a listen. Okay, now, I haven't really done anything to boost except for maybe in the high, high highs. If anything, I'm robbing energy out of the track by subtracting stuff out. With my EQ on, and that's the first effect we're going through, I will now run a compressor. If I decide to run it as a limiter, I have that option, or I could be flexible, kind of really anywhere in between. On this compressor, the threshold, the first thing that I care about, is represented by a blue line here. I can take this blue line and I can drag it up and down. The first thing I'm going to do is kind of leave it kind of high up and out of the way of the mix. Right now it's not doing anything. Oh, 
Okay, I can see the signal going by and it never really reaches that threshold. I'm gonna go ahead and bring the threshold down a little bit. Threshold tells the compressor when to become active. If it's never louder than that blue bar, it's doing nothing. But we probably do want a little bit of compression to help us contain the peaks a little bit. Once they're contained, we can actually turn the whole track up without risk of distortion when we release the track. And the orange line is telling me how much it's actually reducing those peaks. The farther down I bring my threshold, the more active you'll see this orange gain reduction line go. And you heard it is much quieter because you can see all that gain reduction that's in play. A lot of times on a compressor they'll have a button here called Make Up, and that makes up for the lost gain and kind of turns everything back up. I also have an output volume control. So we're going to back this down a little bit. I have engaged makeup, and I'll creep it up to where my listening level should be. Okay, now my threshold's way too low. The next thing I'm going to look at is my ratio. The ratio says, okay, for everything that does go louder than that blue line, all the high, loud stuff in the song, how much does it compress it down? Right now I'm at a ratio of 4 to 1. For the math people out there, that means if I have any peak going 4 decibels louder than that threshold blue line, it will be reduced down to 1 decibel louder than that line. So it is still allowing it to get a little bit louder than the threshold, at a ratio of 4 to 1. But let's crank it up a little bit. Let's bring this up to infinite. Now, okay, let's go to 12. And really, anything over 10 to 1 is a limiter. So right now, this is a limiter. And you can hear when I stopped and all the tales of reverb and everything else came up. It's a garbage, garbage master right now. But it's to make the point of what the compression is actually doing. And for fun, I'll bring the threshold even lower just to ruin it for you so you can hear it. Here's without compression. It reads. And with it. Squashed. Terrible sounding. And without it. Well, that life's back in it. And with it. It's pumping and swooping. And all the reverb tails and everything become all kinds of problems. So let's set it up where it would actually make sense. I'm going to bring my ratio way, way down again to about four or so. I'm going to set the threshold so I only see it on the meter as catching the loud players here. Because I don't really want it messing with the bottom, quiet, dynamic stuff in my track. Okay, right now I can see it's doing nothing. Bring the blue line down. Oop. Caught a little peak there. Okay, that's catching some peaks there. This I can manage. I'm going to bring the ratio up a little bit more from around 4 to 1. And I'm up around 6 to 1. Now, at that point I was in a little bit of danger. I heard the track actually sort of pulsing and pumping, and I didn't like it. And that's a combination of me having the threshold probably a little bit too low and running that ratio a little bit too hard. Let's A, B what we've got. Right now, nothing on my mastering chain. Here's the mix. I'm going to put the EQ on first. You'll see it come to life, and then you'll see me activate the compressor. Here 
GQ. The compressor. All of a sudden we're hitting it at about seven and a half. That's a big change from where we were when we started. It's already starting to come up in volume, but that's why we left ourselves some room in our mix when we started. Now there's one final step. You can see that my output is only really around negative 7 dB. I know that's not going to be super competitive with the other music that's out on streaming platforms, but I don't care. I got it in a decent position which leads me to the third and final trick. Now the final trick is right here on the export screen when I'm going to take this master and render it as a WAV file to send out to streaming platforms. The button that we're talking about here is called Normalize. You might have it off. You might have it on. If you turn it on, it will automatically take the track you just mastered, even though it's at negative 7 dB, and it'll bring it up so that the peak volume slides just under 0 dB, like everything else that you hear on streaming platforms. There's arguments to be made about, yes, normalize or don't normalize. A lot of pro pro mastering engineers will tell you, never do it. Well, if you had their experience and their gear, you probably shouldn't. But this is our first master. We can use that as a tool to really get us where we need to be so you sound good on SoundCloud or on YouTube or wherever you're headed. Now there's a few things that we did not talk about today. We didn't really talk about the stereo field. We didn't really talk about the sound stage. We didn't really talk about ambience or reverb or resonances or anything like that beyond using an EQ. This was very simple. Assuming that your mix is good and you want it to sit well and be competitive on streaming platforms, this is all you got to do. A little bit of EQ, a little bit of compression to tame those peaks a little bit and run normalize and you're done. When I was getting started in, in the music business, we had a local guitar player, Lenny Molinari. He's still around in the band Yasker's Farm playing in the New Jersey scene monster guitar player, one of the best. He played a Gibson SG, really I think through a wah-wah pedal, and into his amp, and that was about it. One day he came into the store where I worked, and I said, hey, have you heard this chorusing pedal? And he goes, no, let me check it out. He plugged in and did the rate and depth, and he liked the sound, and I was like, ah, wouldn't that sound good with what you do? And he offered me a bit of advice. He said, look, Every time you add something and go, wow, that sounds better, ultimately you end up with 20 things on thinking, oh, it gets better and better and better. And he goes, and then you shut them off and realize the best tone you had was the tone that you started with. Some wisdom of the ages there. And I should have remembered that when I was watching all these videos on how to master stuff when I saw multi-band compressors and saturators and tape emulators and five different types of EQ and artificial intelligence and exciters and wideners. And I threw all that stuff on my master and when it was done, I hated it. My best advice to you is this. Start with the basics of an EQ and a compressor. That's really what they were using when they were mastering something to vinyl. Without really altering too much the dynamics of the song itself. My two secret weapons are this. These are Olo headphones S4X. I do all my mastering on the Olo headphones. Trick number two is I use this. This is console one software paired with a hardware device. Real knobs control this plug-in in my DAW. EQs, gates, even a nice saturator, compressors, low-pass filters, high-pass filters, and assignable to up to 20 tracks in a bank, and there's multiple banks. I can run this on 40 tracks, 60 tracks, 
it does not tax the CPU very much, and it looks like this. When I move a knob on here, you'll see it make a change up here. That way I can use my ears and actually dial with my hands. And the sound that this thing has, well, here it is bypassed. Here it is with it. Without. Those are my secret weapons, but they're really based on the same EQ you saw me set up with a mild compression with a ratio of about 4 to 1. This track's ready to go. And what about the stereo field? What about sound staging? What about ambience? I do that all in the mix. To me, that's not part of the mastering process, and I do know there are some great mastering engineers out there that will tweak those things. It's a little above my pay grade. Personally, I wouldn't try to do it in mastering, although I, I know there are people who are very successful at it. I'm not, I have no idea how they do it, but certainly back to the mix. Yeah. And no limiters were harmed in the making of this video. Well, guys, I had a lot of fun putting this together. As always, thank you for coming out. Join us in Recording Tips on Facebook for more discussion on this we got a lot of work to do. Let's get to it. And we're live. Hey, hey, guys. Uh, quite the turnout tonight. We've been talking about this in the Facebook group recording tips all week. And all you guys are members there. The idea that so many of our members were talking about what do we do to start mastering. And like I was saying earlier in the video, I had a lot of experience uh, recording and mixing. And I watched a bunch of videos on mastering where everybody has all these plugins and, you know, exciters and saturators and limiters and all this stuff. And every time I tried it, I just felt like my mix was losing it's it stopped breathing right it it became sort of over colorized and that's why i put the story of lenny Moller, lenny molinari say that three times fast that's why i put that story in the video and as a guitar player i think if you've ever run as you keep turning on pedals and pedals and pedals and pedals eventually you realize it almost doesn't matter what you're doing with your hands because it's lost it just you're hearing the pedals and not the player and I was getting that feeling taking my mixes that I worked hard on and having them by the time they released them on a, some kind of a streaming platform or, or put them on a CD or something, it didn't really feel like the song to me anymore. Uh, so I got to thank Oren Fisher for coming out and helping me put this video together and giving me a lot of good ideas. But also the discussion that we had in the Facebook group all week about tips on mastering uh, and so forth. Very, very helpful. It wasn't really a theme week like last week. We had drum week in the, in the Facebook group, but it seemed like we had a lot of posts on that topic, and I think a lot of people were curious about the mystery surrounding mastering, and uh, I totally get that. Uh, so let's see. John says he was using a Waves SSL emulation before console one. Yeah, there's several SSL channel strip emulators out there, which will provide you with EQ and they'll have compression. And that's really all you need to masters a, a very light EQ and a very light compression. If it's mixed right, it should just really be able to translate over to a CD or a streaming platform with doing very little. I do find the one on console one, they have a couple things like in the gate, they have a knob for punch. And I have not seen that on any other emulator except for the one on uh, Softube console one. And if I am using this like purely on a drum track in the gate section, I will sometimes dial punch up and 
get a little extra verve out of it. So I, I did like that. Uh, Brian says, on streaming platforms, I'd say all songs suffer from the same tweaks the, the platform does. So the master for CD, like the pros do, and it will sound kind of similar. That's what I do anyway. I think if you're saying that like a single master and not like a mastering it, one for YouTube, one for SoundCloud, one for iTunes, one for CD. And I find a lot of mastering engineers also believe that way. Kevin McCarthy, a member of the group, and he is a mastering engineer for a living, will provide you with one master if you hire him to master your song. And like Greg was saying, a lot of these streaming platforms are going to kind of tweak them to what their standard is anyway. <laughs> John, Aaron... Uh, Joe, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm catching up with the chat. You guys are, are, are have been very engaged and very busy with this tonight. So let's take this discussion over to Recording Tips on Facebook. And I'd like to thank Orrin Fisher one more time. Also, Joe Breitenbach for he was the guitarist that you were just hearing on that song. Villain FX, we're going to link it below. That's our band of the leaders of the Facebook group, which is Orrin, Joe, and myself. And that music you were just hearing. Explore it. See what you think. That song should be hitting in the next week or two. We'll see how we do. Okay, guys. Thank you for coming out. I had a lot of fun as I was putting this together and chatting with you guys. We have a lot of work to do.